You're fooled, master. Not very much, is it? I am sorry, master. Well, what's your excuse? A massive city like this can't put together a decent meal for a general of Rome. Your type will learn to show some respect soon enough. I understand completely, master. But you see, I am not from this city. Where I am from, food is a luxury. We learned to avoid waste. Eating food is a waste, is it? Or just when I do it? Why shouldn't I have your head right now, you little rat? Well, Lord, because it would spoil your appetite, of course. <laughs> oh yes, you're right. I forgot that having rats around can be amusing. Just get out now. Of course, Lord. Enjoy your food. <laughs> These people make better slaves than Celts. Much better spirits about it all. You'd think being a slave was a chore the way some of them look at you. Hmm. Quite fresh, it seems. Room for improvement. They've used more of those spices they are obsessed with, though. And... And... Oh, what's that? No. No, 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 no. Get back here, you traitor! <coughs> At least... Make it... Taste good! Hello there, welcome back to Fields of Mars. In the previous part, we saw our forces taking Rhodes, but at the loss of Septimus's son, Murna. His army will now be led by Senate Commander Verus. Then we saw another big loss when there was a huge battle between Eutropius the Elder and a couple of Sassanid armies. He very nearly beat them, but he lost his life and all his forces in the end. The good news was that Anisius stormed up the coast into Syria, capturing territory that included Antiochia by teaming up with Septimus and Verus. So now the Sassanids are locked out of the Mediterranean, but Anisius himself didn't last long as we heard. His army is going to have to be taken over by another Anisius, his illegitimate son Anisius, who will now suddenly have to get used to being in a position of command right on the front lines. I'm looking now to secure our position. We've got Sassanids on Constantina, on Cyprus, off to the west. We need to get rid of those guys so they don't come and just counterattack one of these coastal settlements. There's also this little settlement up here, which also has another Sassanid army inside it. This is a thing about the Sassanids that I've noticed. They almost always have a full stack standing on their border region and that's just because they have almost infinite money as an AI entity so they can just hire all the armies up to their uh, Imperium limit and have full stacks everywhere. I was checking here to see just why exactly their garrison is a full stack as well and it's just because their level 3 town building adds 16 or so units to their garrison so that's why they always seem to have a full stack garrison as well. In this particular case it's not going to be too much of a problem because to support the attack by Varus here, we can bring in both Septimus and our reserve force under Costa coming down from the north. So all three generals with all those forces can overrun the two armies inside because all of our guys are higher in quality to theirs and we'll take that settlement. So that's going to complete, I think it's the province that has Caesarea Eusebia as the capital, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, and Septimus now has movement points to go right back to Antiochia. We're probably safe from a counterattack right now because we've taken out so many Sassanid armies recently, it's going to take them a few turns at least to put them back together. Now, I've been complaining recently about public order, and it's finally getting towards the point when I need to invest in this middle line in the civic tech tree. This tree represents religion taking over your state administration, and doing it increases the amount of your population that supports your religion and gives you bonuses to public order. But as you do it, you start to lose technologies and lose access to some of the higher level buildings to represent a sort of pre-Dark Ages mentality setting in where the 
the engineering feats of old Rome are forgotten and people just focus on the organized religion part of their lives. But we're going to have to start doing this, otherwise we're just going to have rebellions constantly and it's getting extremely tedious in the gameplay. Now Aria comes in for another go at Trapezus. Unfortunately, we're in no position to stop them, especially against two armies there. So we'll just lose our garrison. And what will they do with it? Nothing by the looks of it. They've sacked it. But I consider that nothing because as long as we don't lose the territory, that doesn't really cause any hassle. We'll uh, easily be able to repair the damage over time. Now in the next turn, we're going to move out to start looking into taking Constantia. Again, full stack garrison to deal with and a full stack of uh, standing army in the settlement. But despite all that, I thought Septimus alone will probably be enough to take this place down just because of our troop superiority. So we're going to sail over and just set a siege up here. It's a balanced situation. I didn't want to attack because I thought the balance there might cause the enemy to sally. And that would be good for us since we can avoid having to deal with towers. Now we've got some good news. Eutropius the Younger, Septimus's other son, has finally brought the main force that used to be under Julianus down from the Hun front to the Sassanid front and his arrival uh, is put to use immediately taking out some rebels but he's going to have some much bigger fish to fry very soon. Now they did sally against Septimus so this is great news. We'll fight them in the field where this should be a little bit easier. They're going to have overwhelming numbers so we need to not do anything too risky. And the fact they have so many slingers also means this is probably going to be one of these battles where we just can't move at all, but we've won plenty of those before. There is to be no more disorder at any level. I need complete control of the situation to stand any chance. The bickering among the people must stop. You must put your foot down on those who undermine the authority of the Empire and the gods. And no longer must people decide which gods to worship and how. At each end of the earth, the gods will be honoured according to proper tradition. It is down to you to ensure this, lest our new empire crumble before our eyes, as it already is. As for the military authority of my office, it must be total. If there is any aspect of the war that I do not engineer in our favour, there will be disasters, like those I have already witnessed take the lives of my brothers and my eldest son. I have paid dearly for this trust. So here we go, the enemy leading with all of their slinger units, that means we're going to face a bombardment and all of my front line is sitting in stationary to Studo, ready for it. We're blasting the enemy with a bit of onager and large onager fire to get our attack started. Now the enemy's slinging attack was more effective than I expected, not on the front line, but because slingers have a really wide scatter when they fire, you can see on the floor there's little uh, puffs of smoke representing where the stones are falling. They just hit all over the place, so tons of my archers are getting killed by all the missed shots going over the heads of my legionaries. They're doing a classic cavalry attack on our left flank. The AI likes to do this in a sort of half-hearted fashion. They like to come around behind you, but then not fully rear attack your army. They only attack the unit on the end of the line. So those spearmen will be in trouble, but at least they'll have a bonus against the cavalry. And now our main counter to this will be put into play, and that is Septimus himself. He is personally hit right by the point of a cataphract charge. That was extremely dangerous, but actually it went fine. His unit wasn't damaged by it somehow and now he'll be able to win that fight pretty easily. On the other end of the line we've got another flank attack and this time it's camels attacking our western auxilia palatina. They're having a lot of trouble even though they do have a bonus fighting camels. Camels are really good against armored targets like the palatina so they're just taking us down. I'm having to charge in my own cavalry who the camels also will do well against but with sheer weight of numbers we should be able to push them back. Out in the distance there two of my cav units are trying to avoid fighting some enemy camels and just kiting them around and here you can see more damage being done to my archers. There are slinger shots just landing all over the place over a huge area. The ones hitting my front line doing nothing, but my archers are getting annihilated. 
Now Septimus is putting in an extremely good performance. This is what I've wanted to see for the whole campaign. The Praetorian Cav are extremely expensive. They're worth the same amount as several legionary units. They cost about a thousand a turn to upkeep just a single unit of them. So I expected them to be able to easily take down three units of enemy cavalry at once. And in this battle, they finally did. We started pushing back the enemy on our flanks, but in the center, the fight's really getting started with the enemy just piling in tons of trash spearmen fighting against our front line, not really doing anything because they're just not good enough to break through. Most of our archers are in trouble though, I've lost almost a full unit to sling a fire and I'm just pulling back, we're giving up on using our archers for this battle. The enemy skirmish advantage is just too large to challenge them. And in comes their second army, all of their Pygon band will now add their weight to the front line. A big blob formed here and I couldn't resist attacking it with our onagers. I think I might have done a tiny bit of damage to our own side, but overall a nice chance to burn out these tightly packed enemy ranks. I didn't use my explosive onagers on it unfortunately, so that would have done even more damage in that situation. Anyway, Septimus has just cleared up our left flank completely and is now considering going around for a flank attack. We do need to be careful with flank attacks because of all the slingers and archers out there. But I'm going to get this decent charge here, coming into the back of that big blob of enemies. Lots of those guys are low morale and aren't very good, so while there's tons of spears and a cavalry attack it isn't necessarily the best idea, I was willing to let him just fight it out for a bit to try and break them. Some of them tried to escape from that melee and got taken down by our javelins who are also coming in to support this flank attack, so that is good. And Septimus's decision to hack his way through these enemies seems to pay off. Lots of them start routing after taking losses here, and routes cause more routes. So we're really thinning out the enemy's front line, exactly what we need here. Some of the units that were fighting from the very beginning have just been defeated straight up against our legionaries as well. Now their general gets a pretty decent attack on some of our javelins who are isolated out here, just running through everything I had to find these guys and get a rear attack on them, pretty dangerous. But I can now try a rear attack on him with my own cavalry who were chasing after him. They got stuck though on that unit of spears, so the attack against the general didn't really work. But luck was on our side, that unit of spears routed after just a few moments of fighting, so now we can focus down that general with our legionary cav and we should be able to beat him there. Now the left flank attack had to be called off because Septimus started taking big losses. There are still lots of slingers and spears in the area which mean we can't really sustain an attack on the left and now I'm just kiting things away to try and uh, ease up the pressure. On the right I'm doing a small flank attack just folding slightly to try and get a little bit of flanking on the enemy's frontline units. Those units aren't doing much damage to us. Artistudo is just sitting there and tolerating their existence and probably killing quite a lot of them as well. And finally we get that enemy general, and that's going to cause a morale shock across the whole enemy army. We see lots of units suddenly routing away, the balance bar swings into our favour, and that is how the battle ends effectively. I did have to chase them for a while because we're fighting the garrison of the place that we're besieging, so we need to cut it down to size so that we can just auto-resolve the rest of the garrison away after this. And once I get bored of killing them, it ends. Only a close victory. It felt a tiny bit better than that, but we actually did lose quite a lot of men, especially among our archers as I highlighted and the units on the ends of the line that were being attacked did get really heavily damaged by the enemy's cavalry and camel attacks. We can see it here, we actually lost a full unit of archers pretty annoying because there's nowhere nearby we can re-recruit those guys and I was checking out who got all the kills in that fight tons on the onagers, tons on Septimus and his Praetorians, lots on the front line in general as well although a lot of that would have been from chasing routers right at the end Enemy army, mostly destroyed. We got virtually all of both armies, so an order to resolve to finish off the settlement will be on the cards right there. But first, another battle against the Sassanids is brewing. I was wrong to imagine that the Sassanids wouldn't have enough armies to just suddenly appear with a ton of stacks like they like to do. And here they are. This time, it's Anisius, Anisius the Younger, facing his first battle. And it's a big one by the looks of things. Two and a bit armies in total, I expect, coming in. With all the classic units, loads of horse archers and the crossbow cav, cataphracts, onagers, lots of skirmishes and some decent infantry as well. Everything the Sassanids usually bring. Now I wanted to try and get away from this fight thinking we might be able to take on just one or two of the armies at a time. 
It almost worked, it seemed like the Sassanids might have wanted to go for Antioch instead, but they chose not to and came at us again, so we faced almost the same battle. This battle is actually slightly better than the one we just saw, because now I have the garrison of Tarsus coming in instead of the garrison of Antiochia, and Tarsus's garrison is at full strength, which adds a couple of hundred extra men to our side. Anyway, it looks like Anicius' first battle is going to be a very decisive one. Let's see how he starts his career. I understand that you all held my father in quite high regard. I look forward to hearing of exactly why that is as we work together. Allow me to give you my perspective. My father has given me, through all the years, a sum total of two things. First, he gave me life, an act he surely regretted. Second, he gave me this proconsulship, with all you men in tow, of course. That one he certainly wasn't planning. So I ask you to clear your mind of any expectations. I am not his heir, as it were. In fact, I haven't met the fellow he decided to give that dubious honour. The first man he walked through the door on decision day, I suppose. I've done the book work. I know what we're here to do. With your help, we'll do it. You are father's legacy, not me. That was his choice. I hope it was right. For this battle, I'm going to be somewhat sporting, since although the highest point on the map is right in the corner, protecting my flanks with the red line of death, I'm going to deploy a tiny bit away from it, just so they can flank attack me if they really try. There's a bit of space to work with there. Now, at the start of the fight, I'm going to be focusing out here. We've got these outriding cavalry units who need to deal with the enemy's onagers. Their first army has two onagers sitting right here. And of course, we can bait them into attacking these cavalry. Now, the one thing I could do is the classic use up all their ammo tactic by just microing around and trying to get them to miss me. But actually, we can just run in and take them out. Because the enemy is attacking me, the rest of their army has gone on to get into position for that. So the onagers, since they couldn't move while they were firing, have become vulnerable. So after a short time, we can just charge right at them and take them out the conventional way. That's going to be pretty effective. Nothing they can do now. The enemy could bring units back to support. And they even have heavy cavalry nearby. But they were very generous in not doing so. And this crew got completely annihilated. They should have stayed behind the onagers. Since the onagers themselves block half of the charge. And make them okay against cavalry. But anyway. The main fight's going to start far away now. The enemy bringing up tons of crossbow and bow cab. And also some skirmishing infantry. Now my front line is of course sitting in station just judo as usual so it's invulnerable to these attacks but the second line was actually getting quite a lot of damage put on it here i think a lot of the enemies were targeting them which is unusual the ai likes to just target the first thing it can see the nearest thing to it but we lost most of our crossbowmen immediately at the start of the fight you can see i'm falling back my archers as well because it seems we have that skirmish disadvantage and we just don't want to give the enemy the chance now my Outriding Cav went on to take down the Onagers from the second army, which was coming on at the back of the map, and we saw that they actually tanked an Onager shot somehow. They didn't lose any men after being directly hit, which I've never seen before, so these guys are particularly hardy, it seems, and they are going to be successful taking out two more Onagers here. That is very nice, and it was exactly the same thing as with the first army. Their main body of troops had already moved on, so we had this chance to, to come and attack them. They did send one unit back, unlike the first army, these Slingers, but we're just going to get out of there and those cav will eventually come back to join the main fight now. So on the front lines, the enemy are setting up for a gigantic flank attack on our left. They've got enough stuff that they can easily put together five or six cavalry units for a flank attack since the cav elements from the second army have caught up and joined those from the first for this attack. They'll make the traditional start of going after the unit on the end of our line. Luckily it's spearmen, but they actually did pretty poorly in this fight. The enemy's cavalry seemed to outdo them, perhaps because they had them somewhat surrounded. But uh, even so, I'd expect these heavy spears to perform a bit better than they did. They were taking losses pretty rapidly in that fight, which was surprising. And now in they come with everything else. They've got lots of camels who almost got in amongst our back line there. The garrison forces, the Legio Comitatensis, just about stopped them. Had this second echelon thing going on which was able to uh, defend us against this wider flank attack. And now Anicius is going to get his first bit of actual fighting. 
by bringing those Praetorian Cav down to hit the flank of those camels. And elsewhere, the, the Legio are holding strong. They were in stationary to Studo, so that gives them a defense against charges and a bonus in melee fighting cavalry units. And lots of the Cav are cataphracts, so they'll suck in melee anyway. Our spearmen on the end of the line in huge trouble. Can you see them anymore? They've just disappeared under the enemy's cav attack, so we are about to lose our left flank by the looks of things. Their general, though, got himself killed, just trying to attack through the center, so that was very convenient of him. This is going to start morale shocking everything across the battlefield, and some of the enemy's cav pressuring our left actually started running away as a result of this, so that's going to make our life easier. Now we can take all of our legio and push on to try and, uh, well, save some of the survivors of the spearmen but more importantly recapture our left flank and drive away all of these camels and cav some of them are only horse archers fighting in melee so we can get rid of a few of them early on that'll make it easier for us to surround them and get the numerical advantage etc and that fight is going to go pretty successfully for us even though we're fighting cav with legio the legio do good damage with their darts and because the cav are shock cav in many cases the legio do have better melee stats so can just win in straight brawls so that part of the battlefield was eventually shored up and it actually came time to look onto the right flank of the battlefield where the enemy had some crossbow cav who I thought would be uh, destroyed attacking my spear go all but no they ran right through our lines just blasting them apart going through our skirmishes as well these guys are getting very good penetration on us but what can they do with it they end up riding up to where I'd hidden our crossbows at the back just doing nothing they <laughs> unleash some bolts on these crossbow cav a nice taste of their own medicine and that's going to get rid of them soon enough so that flank attack threat has been dealt with and really the first army has been dealt with overall and now we're waiting for a second battle to start and our lines still looking pretty good thanks to those legio commented tenses 5000 sassanids that's those were my sassanids why was Anisius letting his little urchin boy stow away in his army? If he hadn't popped up with suspicious timing, then I would be proconsul. I am the rightful proconsul, even now. The Senate won't step in, but maybe these 5,000 sand weasels will solve this problem where the 500 drunks of Rome failed. We should prepare to march. Not to Anisius, obviously. The enemy will have left themselves open somewhere. And it's time to see what these legionaries can do for me. The way I see it, the wars cost me two fathers, and the gods are probably saving something good for me. Good fortune and bad always arrive together, as they used to say. On the front line, the new enemy troops should have a better time than their predecessors because our men are tired and weakened by the previous fight. And the enemy do have weight of numbers at some points. So you can see our line in many places is just one man thick, so it shouldn't be too hard for them to break through. We need the situation to change as soon as possible. First, though, there was this very deadly event. They sent a unit of camels to attack our spears on the right flank, and they just completely annihilated us instantly, which I did not expect. These spears are supposedly the hard counter to attacks like this. Didn't seem to go that way. We lost 75% of the unit in seconds. One of the fastest kills of a heavy unit I think I've ever seen. These camels have armor-piercing damage on their melee attacks, which I think makes them so strong. And we're going to overwhelm them with uh, the thing the camels counter, cavalry there, and get rid of them. So we'll secure the right again. But those losses were very unexpected and unappreciated. Now the front line's looking dodgier and dodgier. The enemy's weight of numbers here is starting to get them through. And we don't really want to have to fight them with our archers. Some of the uh, legio are being repurposed to act as a reserve in case the front line breaks. But really, it's going to be about flank attacks now. We need to get around and destroy all of the troops behind the enemy's army and then their front line. First, the skirmishers go down to our cavalry. Not going to be a problem. There weren't enough skirmishers to stop a cavalry attack. With that done, in comes some infantry to start inflicting all of those rear attack penalties. Hitting these blobs here, we're probably technically getting rear attacks on all of them because some of their troops will be at the back of the blob in each case. 
So that's going to start things off pretty well. The enemy's morale, once lowered, is going to be easy to shatter. Here comes a Praetorian cavalry charge through our own men, but still effective. A couple of enemy units shattering away there, others running to get out of the way by the looks of things, and that will inflict casualties upon them since they uh, will be killed while moving due to that melee defense disappearing thing. And at around the same time, everything started to shatter and we are not going to let this chance pass us by. We were already in a position to surround them, so we just ate up all those shattering units and annihilated them. It's a heroic victory, the official result of the Inicius name. The elder used to get it quite a lot, and now the younger, in his very first battle, has managed to bag one as well. Very nice. Let's take a look at the results. We did lose a whole unit of those spearmen who were really harassed on either flank and had to do quite a lot of work there. The enemy, though, losing tons and tons of stuff, loads of whole units going away. We can take on warriors to get some of our own losses back. Plus, we're in our own territory, so that will also allow us to get some of our men back so we're going to actually get back to nearly full strength after this the Sassanids won't be able to say the same because they retreated into our territory and in fact they're going to be pretty vulnerable standing there to us just going in and taking them out <laughs> their agent is trying to take down Eutropius the younger there luckily he seemed to dodge the attack so now in the next turn it's time to cash in on all the stuff we just did during that during that end turn sequence first Constantia going down to Septimus, making it a night attack for no reason, just to avoid fighting their uh, troops out at sea there. Probably should have brought them in just as a chance to destroy them, but anyway. We're moving in, and the settlement is ours. Easy peasy. Now, the Assassinids don't have anything behind the front line they can play with. Beyond a few fleets, which they're just currently wasting blockading ports, they can't do anything major right now. After that, we're going to team up with Anisius and Eutropius, the Youngers, to come down and just destroy all the remnants from the Assassinids. One thing that may add to the confusion here is that Eutropius and Anisius look exactly the same. They have the same portrait, so it's possible the reason Anisius is an illegitimate child is that his father was sleeping with Septimus's wife. I'm not sure, but it probably is going to add to the confusion now that these guys are fighting right next to each other on the front line. Anyway, all of the Sassanid armies going down, they're going to lose some decent commanders and a whole load of troops. That's three stacks annihilated. Sassanid's probably not going to be happy about that. And maybe now we're in the situation where we can say we've probably killed enough of them that there aren't going to be four more stacks coming at us in the end turn sequence. And also I noticed we might as well go on and take this settlement since this will move the front line again to another secure position with a walled settlement where we can potentially hold out against superior enemy numbers. And taking it's not going to be all that hard since we've got both our stacks here. One stack already had a small advantage with two stacks filled with veteran troops. No problem, we can just take this place for free with so much damage being done to them. I was starting to think at about this point that the Sassanids may actually have been technically defeated. We might be able to get them to back down because we've taken so much of their territory now and have just recently taken out so many armies. They're probably feeling the pressure, especially because we're actually getting pretty close to their core region of Mesopotamia and even their capital. Paulus down here at Nova Trajana Bostra has an army just outside the walls waiting around to get taken down. We'll need to stop it from going to the west and taking out our unguarded settlements, but I could also go and take enemy territory here. I wasn't quite sure what to do. And here's the most important factor that will inform our decisions for the few turns to come. I came to talk to the Sassanids, and it's true, they do want to end the war. At long last, after these decades of fighting, they consider the themselves losing and want to end it. This can be used to our great advantage, which we'll go into next time. Decades prior, when Constans had captured Rome and overhauled the legal system, he had given huge new sets of powers to the city's priests, allowing them to effectively govern the population. These changes were thrown away when the nobles regained their influence, but now they were starting to return. It had become impossible to ignore how religious disunity and a small hands-off state was allowing the tumultuous empire to tear itself apart. New rules needed to be set in stone, and all prospect for further power grabs ended. Thus, all remaining power would be concentrated in the Magister Militum and the priests of the Universal Roman Pantheon, an official codification of countless pagan traditions into a religion fit for an empire. 
that is all for now. Thank you so much for watching, and thanks as always to the officially dev and patrons for funding this video. We'll put a temporary end to this gigantic global war and start turning our occupied territories into an empire in the next episode of Fields of Mars.